And of course, all of this is just something bad guys would say. So <laughs> we're, we're obviously in that in that latter category. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I I, I get uh, <laughs> reminded every day that I that I am uh, a demonic tool of Satan. Yeah. Um, it, it warms Me the cockles too. of my demon possessed heart. <laughs> Hey, everybody, I'm Dan McClellan. And I'm Dan Beecher. And you are listening to the Data Over Dogma podcast, where we increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion and combat the spread of misinformation about the same. How are things, Dan Beecher? Things are great. Uh, I'm, I'm enjoying, you know, it, it's, it's the fall season. It's an exciting time uh, when, mm-hmm. you know, all the pretty things die and go away. <laughs> And all of the bad weather uh, haunts us and uh, takes over. And I, I try to, I try to enjoy it, but but it's tricky. It's tricky. <laughs> but it's a good time, I think, for a spooky show. Yes, uh, it's a good time w- when we're recording this for a spooky show. When <laughs> well, anyone is listening to it, the spooky time will have passed. <laughs> okay, okay, we okay, fine. We, we, we are recording plan. on Halloween. Yes. Uh, we are. We both have ADHD. You can't expect us to think <laughs> that far into the future so that we record a show and it comes out in a timely fashion. That's yeah. just not how we do. I, but, I just watched uh, Hot Ones earlier, and uh, it's Jimmy Fallon. Uh, the episode that came out today, and it's a Halloween special. Uh, and I was like, they probably recorded this in July. Yeah. Um, but and so I was like, they have a clue what they're doing. <laughs> Look, um, if we if we had producer money, maybe mm. we would maybe we'd be able to do this. But uh, as of yet, we are we're not quite that rich. You guys haven't shared us with all of your friends, and <laughs> you haven't all signed up to be patrons yet. So. Until that point, uh, spooky show comes when spooky show comes, <laughs> and uh, and that am now. Yeah, so. we we barely have production money. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, but it's a fun one. Uh, we're gonna be we're gonna be diving into uh, a subject that a lot of our listeners slash viewers have requested. Mm. So uh, I'm excited about it. So let's just dive right in. Yes, let's. So, here's the thing. Uh, Dan, when we decided we were going to talk about demons Mm -hmm. on the show, here's the thing about this show. Uh, What I have learned from doing this show for a year and a half is that, A, uh, everything I thought I knew about the Bible is probably not right. (laughs) And B, a lot of the things that you hear the most about from especially from certain fringe areas of Christian or you know theological uh, study, you uh, I can dismiss it. Like for mm-hmm. instance, when they you know when I hear people screaming that abortion that the Bible says abortion is the murder of babies and that it's very clear on this, I know that's nonsense. Mm-hmm. And when the and or or if they say that you know the Bible is anti LGBT and uh, and you should be too, I know that that's nonsense. I'm used to thinking that when the fringes are really emphatic about something, it's they've probably really put a whole lot of lenses on it yeah. to get to this thing. So when I started researching demons, I was like, I wonder if that's even in the Bible. <laughs> and then I went and I was like, oh, it's, it's like, in the Bible. Holy yeah, cow. Yeah. <laughs> so it's not that. It's not one of those. Right. It's not one of those things that's not even really there. Oh, it's there. It's in the New Testament. Yeah. Yeah. The so, Oh, that's an interesting point. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll talk a little bit about why. Um, okay. But yeah. Can, but continue. I'm sorry. I interrupted. No, no, no. I mean, I think that's a great place to start. Let's just Let's just dive right in. Uh, let's talk about why I found all kinds of New Testament uh, demonic verses, and mm-hmm. you're right, didn't find much uh, or hardly anything in the yeah. in the Old so, Testament. So just like uh, we have some stuff in that's not in the Hebrew Bible, like hell. Like mm-hmm. you, if you look in the King James version, you see hell a bunch in in the Old Testament, but that's just because. 
it's a bad translation of uh, Sha'ol, a Hebrew word that does not refer to the conceptual package that indexes the English word hell. And the same is true of demon. You don't have a Hebrew word for demon in the Hebrew Bible, mainly because demon is a Greek word. Like it originates in Greek. There is no Hebrew equivalent. And it comes from uh, the Greek word is daemon. Uh, so it's uh, spelled a little differently than, than how we use it, but uh, demon is how it's come into English. And, and the word daemon really only refers to a kind of divine influence. Like, it's not the word theos, which means a a god, a deity, but it's used to refer to the divine influence, power, agency of deities. So divinity might be that. And and it's usually used to refer in Greek literature to the kind of influence where something might suddenly happen, good or bad, and you would say that's a a daimon, uh, that's the demon. And, Mm. uh, but devoid of any kind of value judgment. We think of demon as a negative value judgment. Yeah. It is, um, it's a bad thing. It's evil. It's, it's right. yeah. In, in ancient Greek, it was not. It was neutral. Huh. You could have uh, a demon that made something good happen, or you could have a demon that made something bad happen. But it was this kind of um, faceless, nameless, just mass of divine influence uh, and and so like uh, y- you could also equate it with the concept of kind of a muse, somebody's individual kind of divine inspiration could be mm. referred to that way, could be understood as a type of spirit, something like that. And so that's the word that became what we now know as demon, and um, it gets picked up within Greco-Roman period Judaism primarily in the Anarchic and other pseudepigraphic literature literature. So first Enoch, Jubilees, some other texts from uh, Greco-Roman period Judaism are the ones that first take this word and use it to render some different Hebrew concepts, but then to develop an idea of evil spirits. And that's what gets picked up in the New Testament. Okay, um, But it's also dovetailing with uh, Mesopotamian concepts. So none of this is native to the Hebrew Bible, uh, but in Mesopotamia, in the Akkadian language, you have all kinds of concepts of malevolent spirits and divine entities. And um, to understand how they kind of organize their understanding of, of the divine world, uh, you've got to understand the, the concept of center and periphery. So uh, think spatially about a civilization, and I, I, this is how I think about my neighborhood, like the really nice <laughs> houses are in the center, and then you've got, <laughs> you've got the starter homes, and then you've got the condos, and then beyond that, you've got the apartments, and the uh-huh. bad apartments beyond that. Like, you know, you've got these concentric rings of, of um, increasing uh, value and importance to the, the society, uh, according to the people who live at the center anyway. Um, yeah. And anciently, they thought of the city as the center of civilization, as the pinnacle, the peak of civilization. And the further away you got from the city, the less order there was, the more disorder there was, and the less civilization was possible. And so as you get to the outskirts, you get to places that are less habitable. And then you get into the uninhabitable wilderness, Mm. and the sea and the desert are kind of the prototypical uninhabitable wildernesses where humans can't live and certainly can't build an ordered society. So closer to the center, more order, more civilization. Closer to the periphery, less order, less civilization, more disorder. And that's where, that's the home of all of these malevolent spirits that occupy the wilderness and um, dance with the devil in the pale moonlight. <laughs> and so um, in like uh, in Isaiah, you have the Lilith, Lilit in Hebrew. This only occurs in reference to this prophecy about how uh, Jerusalem would become this desolate, uninhabitable wasteland occupied only by the screech owl, I think is how the King James Version renders Lilith, but mm. it mentions all these kind of demonic forces. And like even Azazel, uh, you know, if you go, that's that's uh, the entity that's out in the desert that you're leading the scapegoat uh, out to. So these um, disordered, malevolent entities occupy 
the uninhabitable wilderness. And so in Mesopotamia, they were, they were always threatening the order of civilization. So you had to have a bunch of different ways to keep them at bay. And that was different charms and different kinds of magic that you would use. And, you know, women during menstruation had to uh, make sure they were doing certain things because that provides um, a convenient uh, portal for some of these demons. You know, in Egypt, you wanted to make sure they didn't come in through the ears or through the nose because those Mm. were particularly susceptible orifices as well. So this kind of they, they, this kind, they need they need a physical entree into the body is what you're saying. Yeah, and in this time period, we don't yet have this this dichotomy of material and immaterial. Everything is is material in one way, shape, or form, but some things are a different kind of material, and you know, more pure right. spirit was still material. Uh, spirit was like um, analogized as wind. Like even the word ruach spirit means wind, and so you okay. can you can feel the wind, um, just like you could feel spirit. But it was also something you know you can't you can't like grab the wind. You can't well you can break wind, but you can't break <laughs> the wind. Right. Um, and so it's impervious. Can you uh, paint with all the colors of the wind? Well, Sometimes. see, that's a different story. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> it has no color. But um, and so these uh, these spirits are are conceptualized as something like the wind, so they can get in you, um, yeah. you know, um, if you're not careful. And this is this is kind of what gets conflated with the Greek concept of the daimon. Uh, within Greco-Roman period Judaism. They're taking some of what they have, uh, some of the residual Mesopotamian influence from the exile and from the Persian period, and they're mixing it with some of the Greek concepts. uh, And we're also mixing it with some uh, Hebrew Bible texts. So, for instance, the sons of God, they come down and they have children with uh, the human women from Genesis 6, verses 2 through 4. That's kind of the foundation of the Anachic tradition, which then reinterprets it and expands on it and um, generates this narrative where they come down and they and they have these children who are the giants, and the giants have children who are the Nephilim, and the, the spirits of the deceased Nephilim are the evil spirits that then become the demons. And so interesting. So okay. According a, to one um, narrative, there are a bunch right. of different narratives, but that's yeah, kind of, and that doesn't seem to match up with the narrative that I got from multiple sources in my research about okay. sort of the origin story of the demons. Okay. But I, I don't know. We I guess we can just talk about that. I you yeah. know, I've I found in a few places where it would say that demons are, and you know, this one uses Second Peter as its reference point for this, but it it says demons are angels that sinned, yes, uh, and rebelled against God, and so they are destined for hell, and they're going to torment as many of us as they can before they have to go there, or something along those lines. Yeah, so um, so there we have we have the idea of these these angels. So in the Anarchic tradition, and and we see this primarily in in Jubilees, the uh, the angels they're, they're created on the first day, um, and they watch the rest of creation. And you know they're they're uh, the the Muppet babies just kind of like hey everything's great. <laughs> and um, but then when you get the story of them descending, um, because uh, you know they're just way too horny. Um, that then leads to uh, all this bad stuff. So they fall, and then you've got these named angels who uh, are are doing all this bad stuff. And oh, then I in e- in Enoch, God is is like uh, tells the other angels, like Gabriel and and Michael and and these others, is like go bind them uh, under the earth for you know for seventy year you know whatever years of years. And um, oh yeah, and so they are. Uh, imprisoned and they're bound, and and this is where we get the development of concepts of hell. It's right. originally for the angels, so the disobedient angels are also another kind of conceptual template that dovetails in with the idea of demons. So that's so, that's from Enoch. That idea comes like what's fascinating to me about this. One of the fascinating things is that like most of Christianity rejects the Book of Enoch as scripture currently 
Yes. But it's very Most of clear. Christianity is also descended from the Book of Enoch. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's yeah. so clear how powerful the influence of that book has been when you look at, you know, the stuff that m- makes it into the New Testament. It is mm-hmm. like all of it references it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, concepts of the devil, concepts of. Uh, hell concepts of heaven, uh, the it's all there. So the, um, the the second Peter verse that I was talking about that was mm-hmm. referenced in that article that I was reading is Second Peter two, verse four, which says, "For if God did not spare the angels when in they the sinned, but Noah, yeah. but cast them into the hell, into hell and committed them to chains of deepest darkness to be kept until the judgment," and I. I didn't know where that came from, but I guess it's an an Enoch thing. Yeah, and and you have uh, so that's a reference to Enoch in like the Book of Jude. You have a direct quotation from. Enoch. Oh yeah, yeah, and um, here in um, Enoch chapter nineteen, and Uriel said to me, "There stand the angels who mingled with the women." And their spirits, having assumed many forms, bring destruction on men and lead them astray to sacrifice to demons as to gods until the day of the great judgment in which they will be judged with finality. Uh, And the wives of the transgressing angels will become sirens. So this, this narrative is an opportunity to take all these loose threads and weave them together into this tapestry that becomes the backdrop of the development of of Christianity, but actually that this reminds me, I want to focus on something because it says, led them astray to sacrifice to demons as to gods, uh, meaning as if to gods. Mm -hmm. And this is actually the, this is quoting, uh, well, kind of, this is uh, paraphrasing Deuteronomy 32, 17. And this is a very influential text in the development of the the concept of demons because uh, Deuteronomy 32 is the song of Moses. Um, It went triple platinum. Um, (laughs) (laughs) um, I I think uh, uh, Pharrell probably ripped it off at some point or another. But um, I'm just kidding. I have nothing against Pharrell. Um, But it says here, uh, it's talking about Israel in the wilderness, uh, things they did wrong, things they they sinned on. And it says they sacrificed to Shadim. And that's a Hebrew word that probably is related to uh, a an Aramaic word, Shadain, which is like a class of deity. Mm. And we see it in an inscription that was discovered called the Dear Allah inscription, which, which mentions Balaam. Um, but that's uh, there's probably a, a kind of secondary class of deities. Um, and it says they sacrifice to Shadim, not to God, comma, gods they did not know, um, new, uh, to newly arrived ones uh, whom your ancestors had not feared. And so uh, this is this is condemning the Israelites because they were sacrificing to other gods and mm. It calls them Shadim. And this might be, in fact, I think it's probably related to the root from which we get Shaddai. El Shaddai. I probably shouldn't sing that. But um, so it, it's probably related to God's title, Shaddai, which yeah. may come from this specific class of deity. But when it came time to translate that into Greek for the Septuagint, they didn't really have an equivalent for Shadim. And I think Shadim probably occurs in, in maybe like two or three other uh, passages in the Hebrew Bible. Let me see. Um, yeah, it looks like it, it uh, occurs also in Psalms uh, 106, 37. They sacrificed their sons and their daughters to Shadim. Um, and they chose uh, Daimon or Daimon to, to translate Shadim, which huh. meant that these and and there's an argument to make that it's probably because we don't know what kind of deities they are. They're just these nameless, faceless deities. Oh well, Damon means kind of a nameless, faceless divine power. It's this undifferentiated mass of of divinity, and so well, oh, that makes perfect sense. Let's go with that. Uh, but then the daemon beca- becomes the um, the object of false worship. It becomes false gods. It becomes 
wicked deities. Right. And that plays into the development of the uh, the Anarchic uh, tradition and jubilees and, and stuff like that. And so by the time of the New Testament, all of this is coming together and who is it that they sacrifice to? Oh, they sacrifice to demons. And so when you look in most English translations of the Bible now, uh, because the, the Septuagint rendered uh, daimonis for shedim, they sacrifice to demons, not God. That's the NRSV UE. They sacrifice unto devils, not God. That's the King James Version. New English translation, they sacrifice to demons, not God. So, um, so now we have demons in the Old Testament. Okay. Because of the Greek translation, um, and so we're we're building this construction of demons going all the way back. Yeah, but but that's a case of backfilling, right? Like that's not that that that's l- unlikely that that's the 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 newer concept of demon is what is meant in with with the shadim concept. Yes, yes. The the whatever Shadim was intended to mean when that um, was composed in Hebrew, that has been overlaid with the much later right. concept of the demon. So yeah, it is altering what's going on there. Um, but most English translations are just content to say, yeah, we'll just use demons. Yeah. Whatever. Who cares? So let's let's move then to the New Testament and talk okay. about what that idea is. What is like, do we have a sense? I know it's like demons are mentioned plenty of times mm-hmm. in the New Testament and almost casually in a bunch of ways. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking now of uh, of Luke 8, where uh, uh, in verse 2, it says, and Luke 8 has another demon thing, but in verse 2, uh, it, you know, it's talking about how uh, how Jesus... Was was sort of walking, and he was accompanied by uh, a bunch of people. And uh, verse two says, as well as some women who had been cured of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Herod, stood. Blah 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 blah. And it's just like it feels so like thrown, just sort of cast out. Oh, and then Mary, and boy, we, she had seven of them, but they got rid of those. Yeah. It's no problem. <laughs> yeah. It didn't. It just doesn't feel like, the, like, we don't hear that story. It's just like a side note that, like, also, she had she had a whole bunch, but uh, but we got rid of those. Well, there, there was probably a tradition that was in circulation back when Luke was, uh, or at least the author of Luke, was uh, gathering their sources. And so it, it's a throwaway line. It's, it's uh, uh, you know, referring to something that people at that time period would have known. But obviously that story has been lost to us. Uh, but yeah, it is, it is kind of, that, that's the world they lived in. It was, it was a, a demon-haunted world. <laughs> where, um, you know, because, you know, the wind blows and, you know, it might give you an earache, it might uh, go up your nose, you might, you know, swallow a mosquito or something like that, and you might have a demon get in there, and yeah. that might make you sick. If you feel depressed, maybe that's a demon, like that they, they were attributing an awful lot of different things to demonic possession, including mental health issues um, and, and other um, pathologies, I'm sure, that we don't know about. Um, yeah, so- I mean, I think I think that's the thing, right? Like, I w- I was going to get to that later on, but oh. <laughs> it definitely seems like no, it's fine. Like, it definitely seems like what we're what a lot of this is is just explanations for things that we now know are caused by entirely other things, you know, mm-hmm. for mental health issues or for you know disease or whatever. Uh, it seems like if someone just starts vomiting vi- ferociously out of the blue, you know, before there's germ theory, it's like, I don't know, probably a demon. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like what else, what other explanation are you going to have? If someone's just, if something, you know, if someone is having a, you know, a psychotic break, you're not going to be like, oh, I, I, that's there's probably something wrong with uh, their brain, or maybe they've had a, yeah. a, you know, whatever. They're 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 going to immediately immediately jump to there's something external affecting them. 
Yeah. And, and I think the, um, you know, we all have kind of an internal um, anti-contamination system that's kind mm. of intuitively built in. And, you know, it, it's kind of why um, people hate the uh, the smell of flatulence, so anybody else's anyway, because yeah. the intuitively it's kind of like, ah, this is harmful. And it's not, but we all have that internal contamination system that, um, that is compelling you to perceive certain things to be harmful. And, and there can be, uh, uh, you know, sometimes it has to do with food. Sometimes it has to do with actions. Uh, there is a uh, sexual disgust sensitivity is a part of that. People think certain sex can be contaminating. Mm. Um, and so when you have that that's sitting so close to the surface because they don't have better explanations for what's going on and they're and they're not really thinking scientifically according to how we understand the term and in other words they don't have enough information for their um reflective cognition to overrule the intuitive side of things the intuitive side of things gets to drive and and that is going to uh, because of the proximity to uh these other ideas about a demon haunted world the gravitational pull is just going to be too great. And so your internal contamination detection system is going to very easily connect things you're afraid of and, and things that you might perceive to be the outcome of contamination to um, align with the notion that there are demons uh, everywhere around and, us. And that they get inside of you. Like, that's yeah. the other thing is that, you know, if you go further down in Luke uh, chapter 8... Mm -hmm. You get to a guy, uh, in Matthew, it's two guys, uh, who is, uh, who's, who's living in the tombs and who is, uh, possessed by demons who, who is, yeah. you know, what we would call possessed. He, he, somebody, somebody's actually living inside of him or a bunch of somebody's as it turns mm -hmm. out. Talk about that. Where did that come from? That just, that it's such, I mean, and this is the guy, just so we get the story, uh, the broad strokes are this guy uh, is a, a crazy hermit guy, lives out in the wilderness-ish, um, I guess. Um, or at least on the outskirts. It's, it's uh, yeah. if there are tombs, this is on the outskirts, which again, you overlay that center periphery idea yeah. And it's like he's he doesn't belong in civilized society. He's got to occupy the outskirts. And um, anyway, Jesus approaches him and he cries out and uh, he cries out and fell down before him shouting, "What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me." Uh for Jesus had commanded the unclean spirit, that's singular, to come out of the man. Um, for many times it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the wilds. So he was like amazing, crazy strong and would break the bonds, you know, whatever, whatever they mm -hmm. tied him up with. Uh, Jesus then asked, what is your name? He said, Legion for many demons had entered him and Legion in this case, is that, it's usually it's capitalized as though it's a proper name, uh, but then legion does mean a a troop or whatever. Right. So what what are we talking about with that? Well, so he I he understand. He asks what his what his name is. Yeah, and he says legion, but but yeah, the idea is just the demon is is um is identifying as uh, a multiplicity of of demons. So it's not just one demon because the the number shifts. Right. Uh, asks what his name is, and then he says uh, Legion um, because um, many demons had uh, entered into him. And I think the um, daimonia, yeah, as soon as he says that, it shifts to uh, the plural. That's a neuter nominative mm. plural uh, had entered it into him. And then it says, uh, they, where, where's the NRSVUE? They begged says, him. Not yeah. to order them to go back into the abyss is what the NRSV UE. And so it's back to the plural. And so the idea is um, upon first glance, this is a single demon. And Jesus is like, oh, yeah, we take care of this all the time. I can do this on a weekend. And but then it's like, oh, no, it's a bunch of them. It's a um, bunch of them. And and for whatever reason, I guess when they get cast out of the guy, 
They have to go back to the abyss if they can't find another place to be. <laughs> and they beg Jesus. That's so weird that the demons are like, please, just put us in the pigs. Will you put us in the pigs? We would love that. It's not yeah. Jesus like, ha ha, I condemn you to, to pig life. They're asking for it. And Jesus is like, yeah, go ahead. It's all right. <laughs> well, in, and it's, uh, you know, it's fitting because they, what kind of uh, demons are they or spirits are they? They're unclean. What is a pig? It's unclean. And so it's, um, they're drawn to a more or more natural habitat. And this is why the demons are, are, um, you know, shoving the guy out into, uh, what did you say the, uh, what is the King James said? Uh, I'm in the, the driven him into the wilderness or driven him into the wilds. <laughs> into the wilds is yeah. And, yeah. and, uh, and the word there in, I lost my place. Um, yeah, it's, uh, Edimos, the wilderness, mm. because that's where demons are located. Yeah, at the uh, outside in the periphery. So, and so when they were when they were in the man, they were making the man run out, go to the wilderness, go to their habitat. Yeah. So, like, think Stranger Things. Yeah. He doesn't like uh, what is it that he doesn't like? He doesn't like the hot. He likes the cold. Yeah. And okay. so, you know, he he wants to crank up the air, and then you drive him out by by making it all hot. And and so it's the same idea. This is kind of a very intuitive, natural notion, and and it comes from the the very natural and intuitive notion of of possession, mm. um, which is something that you find in all kinds of societies around the world and throughout time. This notion that, and I've talked about this a little bit. Um, it's in my book. Uh, where you know the human body is conceptualized as a container. Mm. We have an inside, we have an outside, and the inside is where executive control is located. And because we have these unseen agents um, all around us for good, for bad, or sometimes they, they can be neutral. And, and that's why you want to make sure your, your orifices are all um, taken care of, either through your apotropaic amulets or whatever spells... Uh, or whatever you you have um, that keeps them out, so they can't get in. Because if they get in, then that, that's where your executive function is uh, is located, and they can take it over. Right. Uh, and so, uh, demon possession or spirit possession is something that is phenomenally widespread, trans culturally, trans historically. It's just something that we find all over the world, and and this is just the first century CE. Greco-Roman Jewish manifestation of spirit possession. Only these spirits are unclean. Um, and then, you know, prophecy is a product of spirit possession as well. Only the clean the good spirit side. of God. Yeah. I hadn't uh, thought of that, but that's really interesting. So, yeah. so, yes, I mean, people talk about, I guess I had thought about it because I, you know, when I was researching for this, I did stumble on a, a video uh, that that was like, don't worry, though, demons can't get into us good Christians because we're already filled with uh, with the spirit of God. Well, that's possession, right? Like that's uh -huh. that's basically the opposite side of this coin, mm -hmm. which is yes, we're already we we've you know it's good possession, but 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 we're already uh, filled up. <laughs> There's no room for legion in here. <laughs> yeah, well, and and you've got this uh, this metaphor. There's another part where um, the they talk about the person's body as a house, and you've got the the strong man who. Uh, who, and I'm forgetting precisely what the metaphor is, which is embarrassing. Um, <laughs> but you've got to tie him up, um, mm -hmm. and you know you've got to sweep out all the uh, all the unclean stuff. And so, yeah, it's it's you know this is just a, a function of this perfectly natural side effect of human cognition is that we understand ourselves to be containers that can sometimes be taken over. And and you know you look at uh, the possession of of Saul. When Samuel says to Saul that uh, God's spirit is going to, usually the, the translation says something like overtake or overcome you or something like that. But the Hebrew root is salah, which means penetrate. Mm. God's spirit is going to penetrate you non-sexually, or maybe it is sexually. <laughs> and, um, and it says, we'll give you a new heart. And that's how you will be um, you know, anointed king is you'll have a new heart 
Mm. Uh, and and so the because the heart is conceptualized as the seat of cognition in that is located internal to you. And so we we think of the the seat of uh, cognition is the brain now. And so, you know, we're going to switch brains and then, you know, that that changes who's in charge. For them, it was the heart. God's spirit is going to, uh, you know, possess you, take you over, change out your own heart for a new one that belongs to God. Uh, and so it's it's the same thing, only we like this kind of possession. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I. Can I just bring up a silly side fact and just have you answer it for me really quickly? You had mentioned Maybe. that that it makes sense that the 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 legion is cast into the swine because uh-huh. uh, unclean goes into these these unclean animals, but the swine herd that that herd of swine was owned by a a person who was taking care of them and was presumably kind of upset that his <laughs> whole like livelihood was that then like stampeded into the lake and drown. Yeah. Uh, I, so there must've been people who were eating pigs at that time. Oh yeah. Well, they're, yeah, they're not in, um, they're not in a, a, a Jewish dominant territory right now. Okay. They're on, they're on, uh, they're to the East of the, the sea of Galilee. Now there's a traditional location for this. That's right on the shore. But uh, depending on which manuscript you look at, it has different names for this location where they are. Mm. And when we've tried to locate places that went by that name in the first century, they're like miles away. Mm. So it's like the the pigs didn't just run off a cliff or down a down a hill. Um, <laughs> they would have been like, "Are we there yet? Shut up!" Um, and uh, <laughs> And yeah, the idea is that they've, um, you know, they they drive the the man out into the wilderness, and they're just like, let's yeah, let's get these pigs somewhere, and they just uh, who knows, accidentally or intentionally, uh, drive them into the water and kill them, and um, you know the that's how that's their their just desserts. And when it when it says abyss, um, the word there, the Greek is is abyss, but this is the nether world. This is yeah. where the wicked uh, angels, the evil spirits, were being kept. So, so basically, we need to occupy these humans, or we're going to go back to the chains and the darkness where we await judgment. That is mentioned in um, in the Anarchic tradition, and then is picked up within the New Testament. So basically, yeah. this is our you know we're out here joyriding um, so that we don't have to, um, and you know that's keeping us out of jail. Right, uh, so we want to we want to be joyriding even if we have to get in the pig mobile, um, <laughs> and then you know we're gonna <laughs> and then the pigs immediately drown, presumably presumably depriving them of their yeah of uh, their mobile yeah and presumably off, they off they, they go back to the abyss anyway yeah um I just wanted to provide the coda of that story yeah which I find hilarious which is that the the swine herds run back and tell everybody in the town what happened and they're like hey Jesus would you please leave. <laughs> we, yeah. we we we're uncomfortable with everything. Yeah, we would yeah. like you to please go. <laughs> Quite the buzz kill. <laughs> you, you killed all this dudes. Yeah, you helped that one guy, but then all this dudes' pigs are now dead. That's just not nice. Yeah. So let's talk a bit about how demons like how they were meant to affect people. Because we talked about the, the the possibility or what I would deem the likelihood that this demonic possession was just a an ideology or a way of explaining uh, just, you know, various health slash mental health um, mm-hmm. afflictions. Yeah. I, do we Do we have a sense of like, what they were explaining, what 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 things were happening to people? Yeah, uh, we've got we've got a few different things that are explained as demon possession, where Jesus heals people by casting the demon out, as right. if it was simply a mechanical issue. Right. That oh, here's your problem. You got this demon. <laughs> Let me just get, get, get uh. okay. There you go. Um, yeah. So like in Matthew nine. Uh, verse thirty two starts after they had gone away. A demon possessed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the one who had been mute spoke, and the crowds were amazed and said, never has anything like this been seen in Israel. 
So he's he's making the uh, the deaf to hear, the mute to speak, and a lot of this is attributed to his uh, authority over demons. And mm. so this is this is a way to signal that uh, he has this power over demons, um, and can just you know boom, you're yeah. healed. The demon is is gone. See there, he's got away. Um, and uh, and presumably they go to the abyss or whatever, but um, but then the in in verse thirty four it says but the Pharisees were saying by the ruler of demons he casts out the demons, um, and and this comes up later where um, they they accuse him again of of casting out demons by uh, Beelzebul, which is oh meaning he's summoning the power of the of of Big Daddy demon yeah like this is get- all this is all just a grift. He's uh-huh. he's just like they're in league together, and um, and he's like I've got to cast you out so I can dupe them into thinking that I have power over you. Yes, sir. And um, right. so that's that's the accusation that they're making. And then and then Jesus gives the the famous um, uh, a house divided itself against itself cannot stand. How can I cast out demons by the prince of demons? Um, mm-hmm. Which was um, yeah, great movie, Kevin Costner. Uh, no, that was that was Prince of Thieves. Never mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and I love uh, and Beelzebul is is an interesting story. So Beelzebub is how most people are used to hearing that. Yeah, and that's how and that's probably how a lot of translations uh, actually uh, of the New Testament render it. But the Greek is uh, is Beelzebul or Balzebul, and that's because it is based on. Uh, the uh, Northwest Semitic storm deity Baal, mm. and the title would have been Zavul Baal. That's a title that we know from the Ugaritic literature, which just means Prince Baal or Prince Lord. Okay, but they've uh, they've altered it. Beelzebub means uh, Lord of Flies. Right. So it's uh, it's a way to make fun. It you know it's it's uh, like the uh, the pejorative nicknames that certain presidential candidates give people that. Uh, that give him trouble. It's just a way to mock and deride. Yeah. Um, but that's one of the that's one example of a of a pathology or a condition um, or a um, a disability that is attributed to uh, demonic possession. There's another one in Matthew uh, fifteen twenty two. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, "Have mercy on me, Lord, Son of David! My daughter is tormented by a demon." But he didn't answer her, and this is where we get, uh, uh, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And she says, yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Um, and uh, the the very uh, problematic xenophobic dismissal of the um, Syrophoenician woman. And he said, and he basically says, woman, great is your faith, uh, you know, zzz, and then from that hour, uh, her daughter uh, was healed, and mm. elsewhere we have uh, we have them describe this um, as uh, you know scratching oneself and uh, and not being able to to walk and all this kind of stuff. So obviously, severe uh, mental health issues are also being uh, attributed to demon possession. Yeah, I feel like I, you know, it's funny because I think. A lot of people might think it, that that it's it's harmless. These these ideas are, are are just interesting, but but you know they're who are they hurt? It's not hurting anyone, but I've you know so many. This is still this is still talked about today. You know I it I saw lots of videos in my research and and found lots of examples of people who were saying you know there was a a recent um. Oh, I don't remember what state. There's a there's a candidate for office in one of the, in in a midwestern state somewhere mm-hmm. I think. Who uh, who's a pastor, and a video just surfaced resurfaced of him saying mental illness is just demon possession. Yeah, and uh, and the treatment and don't take them. You know, don't take your kid who's suffering to a doctor when what what they need is a priest who's willing to do an exorcism. A sort of idea and it's just a a that means that people who need help aren't getting available right. help there is available right. help and they're not getting it and b it also sort of oddly puts the blame onto the victim 
uh, you know, the the person experiencing really difficult things uh, is suddenly blamed for it. Like they were, you know, they weren't spiritual enough. They weren't filled enough with the Spirit of God. And thus they allowed this demon inside of them and it's their own fault. Mm -hmm. And I think both of those two ideas combined, you know, the exorcism is actually on the rise currently as, as, as a, as a performed, uh, right, uh, religious right. And that freaks me out. Yeah. I've, I've seen, I've, I've definitely seen a lot more folks on Twitter, uh, talking about exorcism as, as the, the go-to fix for, uh, problems, uh, particularly for children. Yeah, I'm um, seeing it a lot associated with with people's kids. They're like, don't take them to a doctor. They'll pump them full of drugs, and um, and you know, then they'll turn trans. Uh, so right. you need to take them to an exorcist. And I and I've even had some some proclaimed self proclaimed exorcists um, tell me, oh, this is real. This is totally real. Um, and uh, yeah, that's phenomenally harmful. People die because of that kind of thing. Or experience uh, just massive loads of trauma that they will have yeah. to unpack for the rest of their lives because they were a child and they were told that they were possessed by a demon. Yeah. And that that's not easy to wrap your head around as a, <laughs> you know, eight-year-old or whatever. No, no. It's uh, it's horrifying that that kind of thing continues to uh, the, the kids... Are conditioned to to think that way because I, I mentioned that that this is kind of a, a natural intuitive way of of thinking about um, contamination and and stuff like that. When you don't have enough education for your reflective cognition to overrule those intuitions, we right. have plenty of that now. But if you are conditioned, you can actually condition your intuitive cognition to then overrule the reflective cognition. And that's what happens when you're raised to believe these, th- these things and taught that if you don't believe these things, that that is the influence of demons and that that is unrighteous and that that is what is going to ensure that you're, you know, you don't make the rapture or yeah. that you're going to go to hell. And so it, it creates this internal war between the reflective and, and the intuitive cognition and it allows uh, all of the progress that humanity has made in treating uh, preventable diseases, disability, all of these uh, conditions, uh, so that they uh, are on the rise. It's 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 basically uh, an anti-vax position uh, on well, you know things that are not vaccinated. How many times did we hear demonic uh, discussions? In relation to COVID, like in in relation to instead of go out and get the vaccine and, you Mm -hmm. know, uh, all of the there was like a bunch of the anti-vax sort of rhetoric was centered on religious uh, reasons why this was coming to pass. This this pandemic was happening. And uh, and so if. If there is a spiritual cause, then the then the only cure that's available must also therefore be spiritual. Yeah, I I, I think that that's a you know it's I I guess what I'm getting at because I you know I in I'm in no way trying to talk people out of believing whether you know out of their their Bible beliefs, but I think it's really important to point out that uh, as this idea of demonic possession was very clearly a a new testament innovation it was something that didn't exist throughout the you know the well at least hundreds the, of years of the old testament yeah it, well at least the the identification of these things as demons there was certainly right. the notion of spirit possession and and um, in other societies they certainly also had had those ideas that's why you have these magical texts from Mesopotamia and Egypt that was like here's the spell to get rid of the demon that's clogging up your uh you know your uterus or whatever uh, right. so so they certainly had that but yeah it's not it's not there are no demons in the old testament that's and the idea, sure. so so to me, the idea isn't like you have to give up your belief in in like this shouldn't shake someone's faith if they you know it if they want to keep believing. What it should do is is at very least make people think 
this is explaining this is one explanation for a, a series of of issues. Yeah. We have better, you know, we've had 2000 years to come up with much better explanations for those things. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that, you know, that that the Bible is wrong, but it was wrong about this. You know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. that mute guy wasn't possessed by a devil. It yeah. wasn't possessed by a well, demon. Yeah. And and the story is a literary creation. Jesus did not heal a mute person. Uh, this is just a way for them to have Jesus fulfilling the prophecies that uh, existed or were thought to exist at the time regarding the coming of the Messiah. Well, now you've um, gone too far. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wanted to bring up one one final thing. I wanted to okay. talk about a way that Bible translation uses demons for the sake of um, colonialism. Oh, uh, hey, oh, yes. all right. Yeah, this, Let's... There's this really cool paper that I that I came across while I was doing research uh, on demons for it was for my book, uh, but it was uh, actually it was dovetailing with stuff I was doing at work. And I found book, this pa- wait, do you mean your book, The Bible Says So? No, my previous for... book, but, oh, but oh. The Bible Says So is my forthcoming book available available April now 20th. for pre order. Yes, pre order at uh, the. <laughs> link that we have in my link tree and also and in, in the show notes of this, in the this and notes. every uh upcoming episode so yes um yes. <laughs> <laughs> but there was i read this fascinating paper because i was i was looking at cultural imperialism and and colonialism and this kind of stuff as, as it related to bible translation and there mm. are a bunch of not a bunch but there are some really good um, books on this one's called translating the message um that is about uh Translations of the Bible and colonialism and stuff, but uh, there's this there's this wonderful scholar uh, Musa Dube, who wrote a, a paper called "Consuming a Colonial Cultural Bomb: Translating Badimo into Demons in the Setswana Bible." And what this is about is the fact that when they were translating the Bible into Setswana back in the 19th century, they chose a specific word to render the word "demon." In the New Testament, now in uh, in Setswana, they had a word for evil spirits. They didn't use that word. They chose badimo, and I and I may not have the accentuation right. That may be badimo. I'm not. I'm not positive. But that was a word that refers to benevolent ancestral spirits mm. that helped people, that inspired people, that they sought out for um, uh, divinatory purposes and and all different kinds of things like that for healing and stuff like that. And so the the argument is that the choice to render badimo was based on the desire to eliminate the influence of the benevolent ancestral spirits from this community of um, uh, Botswana or Setswana speakers. So, a so Botswana, sort of a, po- yeah. a poison pill to go back and uh, and 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 degrade their old concepts and their right. old religious practice. So, uh, yeah, uh, exactly that. A way to try to use the Bible translation as a tool of extracting these unwanted cultural um, residues that uh, that they thought were not consistent with Christianity. And uh, the problem is it didn't work because oh. <laughs> the their traditions associated with the Badimo were too strong. And so rather than understand the Badimo as evil spirits, they understood the Bible and this these references to the Badimo as another instrument for uh, facilitating the aid of the Badimo. And so they would use the Bible translation as uh, like spells, as incantations, in order to <laughs> invoke the Badimo, and they understood that Jesus was kind of a, a facilitator of uh, of um, accessing the Badimo, and so the Bible translation became a tool of diviniza- or divination uh, associated with the, the Badimo, because they uh, the and and there's this theory of. Um, uh, host guest ideas of translation where mm. the, um, the target culture is, uh, the host and the, the translation is, uh, the guest. And, and basically the, the host 
what took over uh, appropriated the little poison pill that the guest was trying to uh, to bring in. And so I, I, I think it's a, wonderful exa- it's a wonderful example. It's a wonderful illustration of how Bible something as as ostensibly benign as Bible translation can be a tool for cultural imperialism, but also how it can go uh, it can go sideways if uh, I love if, it. yeah. If you you don't get it right, and uh, well, one wonders if they they read the story of uh, the the d- demons being cast into pigs and started to ask started to like try to communicate with their ancestors through pigs. After that, <laughs> I'm trying to see if the um, there is they do talk about that. Uh, yeah, that was uh, so they use Badimo in that part where they're um, or he sends him into the pigs. Okay, so no, it, it doesn't tell or she doesn't give any examples that use that particular story. Um, but yeah, they they do use the Bible as as kind of an icon, as a a, a bit of an an idol in that regard to facilitate the access to the Badimo. I think that's um, so I, that that's a a heartwarming moment for me. You know, <laughs> I that when. Uh, when when the uh the ancestral thing when the the thing that's trying to be subsumed then uh does the subsuming that's that's kind of fun yeah and you know there's there are all kinds of examples of using vernacular translation for the sake of cultural imperialism particularly in africa uh, uh with portuguese languages for instance as well mm. as in uh in places like uh, the Philippines and elsewhere. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it, it's a messy messy business. Um, yeah. Surprisingly enough, but uh, uh, but it's yeah, not I, surprising I, at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, so I guess I you know one of the takeaways for me on this is just that if you were raised with demon fear, and I think so many people were raised with a lot of uh fear of demons and uh and sort of you know the other side you know, now the rhetoric is all political too you know that you see people like Lance Wall now talking about how Kamala Harris is demon possessed and using demon magic to get where she is and all of this stuff and i i think i think we can uh release it i think we can safely Gently release the demon fears back into the wild. Cast them into a pig. Go, go find yourself, <laughs> or uh, allow them to uh, to sail into the abyss. Yeah, cast um, them back into the abyss because uh, you don't you don't need that anxiety in your life. Yeah. It's not that's that's not what they were meant for, and it's uh, and it's certainly not uh, useful for you. Uh, and and it's it's such a pathetic way to try to cut off thoughtful discourse as well to yeah. just just frame someone as demonic it's it's dehumanizing it's a thought stopping cliche it reduces everything to this zero sum binary game where there are good guys and there are bad guys and there's nothing in between and right that is such a corrosive destructive way to look at the world and of course, all of this is just something bad guys would say. So we're, we're obviously in that in that latter category. Yeah. Oh, I, yeah. I I, I get uh, reminded every day that I that I am uh, a demonic tool of Satan. Yeah. Um, it, it warms Me the cockles too. of my demon possessed heart. <laughs> Well, if you uh, are, if your cockles have been warmed and you would like to become a part of uh, keeping this show going, we love to invite you to become one of our patrons. If you can afford it, uh, go over to patreon.com slash data over dogma and, uh, and throw a few shekels our way. We would certainly, certainly appreciate that. You will, you could get access to um, an early and ad free version of every show and uh, the after party, which is extra content that we make just for our uh, our ten dollar a month and up patrons. Um, also, if you'd like to reach out to us, it's contact at dataoverdogmapod.com. Thanks so much. I hope your demons do well this week, and we'll talk to you again next week. Bye, everybody. Bye.